Hello, students, wherever you are. I trust that you are doing well. Um, during our last lecture, I think we couldn't finish with what we were doing. So this video lecture is supposed to cover up for what we are supposed to do for week four. And so we'll be looking at physical and cognitive development. First of all, we look at the periods of development and then we'll zoom in and do physical development in infancy, childhood and adolescence. Then we'll do cognitive development in infancy, childhood and adolescence as well. And so when we talk about the periods of development, simply they refer to the milestones of development. Um, there are so many, but in psychology, they are grouped into infancy, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and then we have death and dying. But for the purposes of this course, we'll do up to only adolescence. So let's look at the first period of development, that is infancy. Usually, infancy spans the first two years. Infancy spans the first two years. Usually, People will call the first year infancy and the second year they refer to as what? Toddlerhood. And so during the first two years, the child's well-being usually relies on or it depends on what? The caregiver. So the caregiver is the one that bats for the child, ensure that the child feeds properly and cares for the child in terms of grooming, etc because usually by the first two years, the child is not learning to what? Take their first independent uh, step and then start making what? The preparations or the rehearsals towards greater autonomy so that they can do things for themselves. Then we have childhood, which is from age two upwards to age 11 years. Usually some people divide it into two. We have early childhood and we have middle childhood. But for the purposes of this course, we are just going to lump them together. In childhood, the body becomes longer and leaner, motor skills are refined, and children become what more controlled and self-sufficient. So by age 10 or 11, most children should learn how to bath for themselves. They should learn how to wear their own shorts, wear their own shirts and shoes and tie their laces. They're able to master new skills and responsibilities as well. And so this is the period where the child also shows increase in motor abilities, such as the, the need for play, etc. Then we come to adolescence. That is from age about 11 to 18, some will say even 19 years, which marks the onset of puberty. And puberty is just a transition from childhood to adulthood, where there is sexual maturity, the body is developed, the male starts producing sperm, the female starts having their first menstruation. And so the child is matured now to move into what? Adulthood. So let's begin with physical development and we'll do physical development in infancy. Usually every day after the child is born, every day the child puts on weight, the child adds an ounce to their weight. And so they do that severally. So by the time that the child is one year, their birth weight should, what, should have tripled. And so at this stage, we say that what, the child needs to be cared for thoroughly because when there is neglect, it can affect what development in other domains like the cognitive and the social emotional. So usually children that are around 3.3 to 3.5 kg at birth, or let's say seven pounds will become 12, uh, 21 pounds. That is about um, uh, seven kg. Uh, by the time that they get to the first year. But when it gets to second year, growth is a bit what, slow, but uh, it is also rapid. So by the time the child gets to two years, then the child is about what, 28 pounds. Now, aside increase in weight, the child also increases in what, height. So from about 20 inches from birth, by the time that children are two, they should be between 51 to 86 centimeters. Remember that these numbers are just norms and that people can vary. 
based on what the genetic diversity and even the race of the individual. So every race or every group has their own norms, but averagely for Africans by age two, the child should be around 51 to what, 86 centimeters. Now, one of the things that children develop in infancy is what we call motor skills. Motor skills simply refers to the learned ability to use or to move certain parts of the body, ranging from actions such as the flip of an eye, flicker of an eyelid, the flip of fingers, moving of the hands, and even towards the leg. So the word motor, as we are using here, refers to the movement of muscles. But how are children able to start movement of what muscles and body parts? How do they learn that? It begins with what we call reflexes. Motor skills starts with what we call reflexes. And a reflex is just what an involuntary or an automatic action that your body does. And it is involuntary because you, the child does not consciously do it or the child does not say he's going to what, blink the eye or lift the hand. It just comes automatically. Uh -huh, that is what happens. So there are so many reflexes that infants have. We have reflexes that maintain oxygen supply. So breathing in and out, the child does not consciously say, okay, now I'm going to breathe in, or now I am going to breathe out. The breathing in and out comes automatically. Then we have others like ref uh, reflex hiccups, when the child is having hiccups, or the child sneezes, or the child crashes the hand, that is moving the arms and the legs about to escape something that covers the face. So you know that when children are put down, they begin to what? Push things that are covering their face or their bodies by what? Putting their legs and using their legs or their hands to shift the objects. And that is what we refer to as crashing. Then we have reflexes that maintain constant body temperature. We have reflexes that maintain constant body temperature. So when children are cold, they shiver. Sometimes they cry. Uh -huh. Or when they are in pain, they cry to show that what they are feeling cold, the temperature is cold. Or when they are hot, they try to push away blankets or things that are covering their face. So these are movements or reflexes that help the child to maintain some level of what temperature. And no human being should have a temperature of what averagely 36 um, degrees Celsius. We have certain reflexes that also manage feeding. The sucking reflex. So if you put anything close to the mouth of the child, the child will begin sucking. And that is what even helps the child to what feed using breast milk. And then um, anything that touches what they are Lips, they suck. So it's be it blanket, be it somebody's hand, be it their toes, they'll begin to suck it. They, all, they also have what we call the routine reflex, where they turn their mouth upward and brush against anything that passes on their cheeks. So when you put something on their left cheek, the child will what will turn their face towards that or their mouth towards that to suck it. That is what we call the routine reflex. We also have the swallowing reflex, which helps the child to what, swallow whatever you put in the child's mouth. It includes breast milk, it includes normal feeding, etc. Normal food that the child feeds on. Other reflexes that the child engages in includes the Babinski reflex. So when a newborn's feet is stroked, the toes are lifted what, upwards. We have the stepping reflex where when you hold the child upright, the child will begin to make steps as if they want to what, walk. It is a reflex. This is an involuntary movement of their legs. We have the swimming reflex, where when you lay the child horizontally, the child will stretch the legs and the hands. Usually you see it when they are carrying them on the lap uh, and their parents what, or their caregivers want to bath for them or clean them. Then we have the palmar grasping reflex, where the child, anything you put in the palm of the child, the child holds onto it very firmly. 
that they don't even want to leave it out. That is the grasping reflex. Then we have the moral reflex, where when someone bangs on the table or anything they are lying on, they will fling their arms and bring it together on their chest and they'll start to cry. This moral reflex shows that the child has started learning how to react towards any threat or anything that is in the environment that poses a danger to the child. Now, before we come to gross motor skills, let's do fine motor skills. So from reflexes, we move to fine motor skills where the child learns to make what? Small body movements. So when we say fine motor skills, we mean that physical activities that involve small body movements, particularly the mouth, the hands, and the fingers. So first of all, the child will have to master how to use their hand before they even master how to use their leg or to even move their whole arm, etc. Also, movements that involve the, the mouth and the facial muscles, like the jaw, the lips, the teeth, etc. They are also fine movements. Usually, the mouth skills precede hand skills. So the child learns how to use their mouth before they even learn how to use what? Their hand. Huh, usually, that is it. So if fine motor skills are mastered, then gross motor skills will not be difficult for the child. And that is why when children are in nursery or in kindergarten, they give them paper and they just ask them to scribble anything that they want. They should just be drawing the lines on the paper. It is for them to master how to use their hands. That is the fine motor skills. So that finally, when they are learning how to write or they are learning how to draw, it will not be difficult for them. So from fine motor skills, we go to gross motor skills. And these are skills that involve what? Large body movement. So movement of the legs, movement of the arms, movement shaking of the head, movement of the body, jumping, running, etc., walking. All these are what? Gross motor skills. And unless the child masters the fine motor skills, the child might not be able to do what? Gross motor skills. And they happen in a cephalocaudal manner. Remember that we said that cephalocaudal means from what head down. So the child will learn how to gain control over the head, move the head. Now the child moves the hand, then it goes to the limbs. So the child learns how to sit to the leg and then to the toes. So by three months, the child will learn how to sit with what support from someone. By six months, the child learns how to sit without support. By eight to 10 months or one year, the child will learn how to crawl. Usually, by one and a half year to two years, most children should have started what? Walking. And so these are the milestones of development. So in the first two months, the babies will just sit and they will stare and wave their arms at any object that is within reach. By three months, they can touch objects, but because their coordination is not so strong, they, they cannot grab very firmly. But by the time they get to four months, most infants are able to grab, but usually the timing of the grabbing is off, okay? They are able to close their hands on objects. By six months, the grabbing becomes very firm. And so they can hold objects very firm in their hand and it will be difficult for you to take it from them. But because around that time, they have gained mastery on how to close their fist very tightly on objects. By age one and above, most children can hold and shake a toy, a rattle, a bottle, or any other objects that comes to the child. Let's talk about another important thing in infancy, and that is nutrition. Nutrition is what? Taking the right uh, types of food in the right proportion to get the right nutrients from it. So nutrition ensures optimum growth in newborns and ensures that they are well breastfed. The World Health Organization, WHO, recommends that Children are supposed to have six months of what? Exclusive breastfeeding. So somebody will ask, what is the benefit of breastfeeding to the child? 
The first point is that it provides a balance of all the nutrients, so all the nutrition that we need. So it has carbohydrates, it has fats, it has protein, etc., to adjust to the age of the baby. Now, the breast milk also contains some minor, minor nutrients, some minor vitamins and essentials that are not contained in formula like Serilac and all the teen formulas that are given to children. It also reduces the risk of illness, including allergies, ear infections, stomach upsets in children. It reduces asthma in children and it improves vision. It ensures that the eye of the child is clear and they can see properly. It reduces illness in later adult life. So it, is re it reduces the risk for what? Diabetes, cancer, heart disease, etc. Then it protects against what? Many childhood diseases like bre uh, breast cancer, etc. Polio, measles, anything because the breast milk contains what? Antibodies from the mother. So somebody will ask, what are the benefits of breastfeeding to the mother? It aids in bonding because as the mother is breastfeeding, the mother is chatting with the child, conversing with the child, smiling with the child. And so the bonding between the mother and the child is strong. It also reduces the risk of what? Cancer. Children are not able to get cancer and osteoporosis. It is also a natural contraception because once you are breastfeeding, sometimes it is difficult for you to what, conceive again, but this does not apply to anybody, uh, everyone because there are some people, even few months after they have, uh, they have delivered, they can still get pregnant again. Then sometimes, the satisfaction that the mother gets that what she's providing the child's needs is also a benefit that the mother can get from breastfeeding. Let's look at malnutrition. Malnutrition occurs when children are not well fed. So they are not getting their food in the right quantity and they are not even getting the right nutrients from it. And so these can lead to what? malnutrition and sometimes the child can contract certain diseases or even die. There are different types or examples of malnutrition. The first one is what we call the protein calorie malnutrition, where the child does not consume enough food. So it results in severe weight loss and other diseases and sometimes it can result in death. We have what we call stunting, so the child does not grow to the, the required height for their age because they are not eating well. And this malnutrition is chronic because consistently the child has not been eating well since they were born. And so the child will be 18 years, but if you see their height, you think that the child is now what 10 years. So that is stunting. The height is not commensurate with the age. Then we have what we call wasting. So the child is what? Severely underweight because they are not eating well. So stunting has to do with height and wasting has to do with what? Weight. We also have marasmus, which is a disease caused by what? Severe protein calorie malnutrition. We said that protein calorie malnutrition is when the child does not get the right amount or proportion of the food. And so the body stops growing, the tissues waste away. And most importantly, at the end of the day, the child dies. Then we have Koshyoko. I think most of us would have heard of it before. It is also chronic malnutrition because the child is not having what enough quantity of the food. So it is a protein calorie deficiency. It makes the child vulnerable to other diseases such as measles, diarrhea, influenza, cholera, etc. Now, all that we have talked about is physical development in infancy. Let's look at physical development in what childhood. By the time the child gets to three years, going on to 11, the child begins to master the gross and the fine motor skills. Aha, uh -huh. 
and also the child begins to what mature and develop more through play play is one of the ways in which children develop what healthily and so we should allow children to play it's not only about giving them tablets and asking them to sit inside the room because it even helps in what social interaction or interpersonal relationships adults need to make sure that children have a safe place to play with ample time appropriate equipment and active play because play helps to even what increase the cognitive capacities for children so a safe space to play cannot be taken for granted because the environment is the third teacher as children are exploring the environment they begin to wonder they see things they don't understand and they ask their parents questions about it so they are experimenting they are exploring their environment to learn more about the environment so the, the environment has the power to enhance children's sense of what capacity for learning so the child will wonder at things that they see they'll come and ask you mommy why is this so or daddy why is this like that so at this stage good nutrition is is, is a must some people say after children have stopped taking breast milk all they have to do is give the child serena anything that you are eating the child can feed on is just that their quantity so the pepper that you put in your food it's not the same amount of pepper you give to your child if you are eating rice, the child is six months to one year. The child can eat. The child can eat some potato, potato. You can blend vegetables to do potato, potato so nicely, so that it includes all the nutrients. We should know that naturally, appetite decreases between ages what two and six because young children naturally grow slowly than when they are infants, and the reason is because. At this stage, they are not engaging in any active activity. And so they are not using, the child is not using the nutrients because the child is actually not engaging in any active work. And so the only way that they can expend the energy or the calories that they get from the food is through play. And here lies the case, some parents do not allow what their children to play. And so in that case, um, the child is not using the energy, so they can't eat more. So if children play less, they burn fewer calories. But once they play more, they burn calories and they can't eat. So you not allowing your children to play will also what, uh, affect what, their appetite because they are getting the calories from the food, yet so they are not um, using it. So in childhood, children learn self-help skills, such as becoming self-sufficient at dressing, feeding, and mastering shoe tying skills. By age 11, most children should learn to bath by themselves, wear their own clothes, tie their own shoelace, brush their hair, etc. These are the basic self-help skills most children are supposed to have. The child also learns how to write and draw. And here, um, if the child is able to master the fine and the gross motor skills very well, learning how to draw or how to write should not be difficult for the child. So the, the scribbling that they do when they are at the lower levels helps them when they, what, they want to write or when they want to draw. Now, in middle childhood, growth is still what, slow and steady, but children continue to add what? more weight and height beyond the sheer fun of playing and uh, the benefits of physical activities is that children also learn what games with rules and so they can follow rules at home for example when they are playing pampana they say if they shoot you it means you're out of the game it is a rule that every child has accepted and so once the person is shot the person is out of the game Learning to abide by rules that exist in play helps the child to also what abide by rules at home. And play is also a form of exercise which advances the physical, the emotional, and the mental health of the child. And it even improves what academic performance. Let's move to adolescence and let's see some of the physical changes that children have. 
So one of the things that characterizes adolescence is the onset of puberty, where the child begins to what, have a rash of hormones. The growth of hormones is becoming rapid. And so the child has puberty. Puberty usually lasts to, um, the first three to five years of, of the onset of the signs. And uh, many more years are required for the child to achieve for psychosocial maturity. What this means is that physically the child is grown, but um, socially uh, the child is not that fully developed. It takes more years for the child to get to that what, maturity level. So you know we have a difference between growth and maturity. So in adolescence, Adolescents have puberty and they are grown sexually, et cetera, but they are not matured. So different changes occur for both boys and girls. So let's look at what some of these changes are. The ladies have what we call the menarche, that is their first menstrual period, which signals that what well, they have begun ovulation and they can what bear children or they can become pregnant. In males, they have what we call spermarchy, their first ejaculation or, or release of sperms. And as I said, erections can occur in children, but once they start having ejaculation, it means what sperm production has begun. And spermarchy can occur whilst the person is dreaming or asleep. It is natural. We call it wet dream or through direct stimulation. And these changes are made possible by what male and female hormones. In females, we have estrogen. And then in males, we have what progesterone. These are some of the hormones that are responsible. So in males, their penis, their testicles become bigger. The scrotum begins to thin and redden. They have pubic hair at um, the abdomen under their armpits. Uh, their breasts begin to swell slightly and temporarily. It is not big compared to that of the females. And that is what we call the man boobs. Their boys begin to sweat more. And that is why some people even have what we call body odor. And that is why personal hygiene during adolescence is very important. How the person or the boy or the girl can take care of themselves so that they don't have odor. Boys have wet dreams involuntary ejaculation of semen as they are sleeping. It is natural. And then their voice break. Their chest also broadens. Now, what are some of the signs that girls have? Their breast begins to develop and it becomes very large. Pubic hair continues to grow on the vagina and under the armpits. They have their first menstrual period, what we call the menarche. Pubic hair becomes very coarse and curly, and then they have hair at other parts of the body, and it is what normal. Then girls also sweat more. They have some white vaginal discharge, and this is not a disease or condition or candidiasis. Usually, this discharge signals what ovulation. Yet, uh, girls get what we call a king. A skin condition which shows up what spotting on the face of the girls. Uh -huh. it, is, it is a condition characterized by what the onset of adolescence. And most girls gain weight. They become curvier, their hips, um, their contours, everything begins to what, take shape. Uh -huh. Now, though these changes occur for both boys and girls, there are differences or there are what we call variations in these symptoms. Remember that when we were studying the principles of development, we said that development varies from person to person. So genetics shows that Africans or African-Americans reach puberty on the average earlier, about seven to eight months than other races, Europeans, Hispanic, Latinos, Americans, Chinese, Asians, etc. Then gender. You know, averagely, females have their pubertal symptoms showing more glaringly earlier than what males. So if you see fraternal twins, that is one boy, one girl, and they are all getting to adolescence, age about 11 to 13, you see that the lady is becoming more 
big and flamboyant than the female. It is natural because the average girl is two years ahead of the average boy in terms of what pubertal signs. But for the males, getting to the latter stage of adolescence before they are able to what show their their signs. So the female height increases before menarche, whereas the boys it increases what late. That is after spermarche. Nutrition. Right nutrition can also affect the onset of puberty. So with good nutrition, you can have your puberty earlier than somebody who is malnourished or somebody who has poor nutrition. And then we have what we call stress. Our hormone levels uh, can affect the onset of puberty. You see the same way that when you are stressed or you are frightened, heightened sense of what uh, any emotion, either emotion of joy or sadness can lead towards you having your menses the same affect what um the onset of puberty so drug addicted parents who are sick neighborhood anything that causes stress in the individual can affect what or delay the onset of puberty now let's come to cognitive development when we come to cognitive development one of the theories, the popular theories that tells us how children develop is the theory of Jean Piaget, and he calls it the theory of cognitive development. So he suggests that the way children think and their intelligence, it changes as they grow and they move through four stages. And every child moves through these four stages. You can't jump any of the stages. You have to move from stage one to stage two to stage three, and finally to stage four. And so the first stage is what he calls the sensory motor stage from birth to two years. Then we have the pre-operational stage from age two to seven years. We have the concrete operational stage, age seven to 11 years. And we have the formal operational stage, ages 12 upwards. We'll take each of these stages and we see what happens under them. Now, the theory focuses not only on understanding how children acquire this uh, uh, intelligence or knowledge, but the nature of that intelligence. So you, it will tell you that children who are below seven years think in concrete terms. You have to show them for them to understand. You can't say things to them in abstract terms and expect them to understand. And the sequence of the stages is universal. That is what I said, that everyone moves in these stages and it follows the same order. So you cannot go through stage three before coming to stage one. You have to start from stage one to stage two, to stage three, to stage four, and then to stage five. So we have the first stage, which is what we call the sensory motor intelligence the first stage, which is the sensory motor intelligence. So here, there are two words here, sensory and motor. So infants or children think in terms of their senses and their motor skills, sensory motor. They think in terms of their senses and their motor skills. How many senses do we have? We have five senses, our sense of sight, our sense of smell, that is olfactory, our sense of hearing, that is auditory, our sense of taste, that is gustatory, and our sense of what the feeling, that is what tactile. So under the sensory motor stage, there are, there are some what stages, about six of them. So from the time that the child is born to one month, it is basically reflexes, sucking, grasping, staring, listening. By the time the child is between one to four months, they acquire what he calls what adaptation, where the child learns how to coordinate the hand, move the hand, etc. Remember, we say that by age uh, four months, the child learns how to grasp, but the coordination is not so strong. Uh -huh. So in these stages, the child learns how to coordinate the hands to get the desired result for muscle movement. In stage three, which is when the child is about four to eight months, the child is able to respond to people. So when you wave the child, the child will smile. 
when you say the child's name, he or she will clap. Uh -huh. They are able to respond to people. Sometimes they are even able to discriminate between who is their mother and who is not. They are picking the cues. Now, about um, eight to 12 months, they are more deliberate in responding to people and objects. So if they are crying and you even come to carry them, you, they know that you are not their mother, so they don't stop crying until their mother finally comes to carry them. Then they stop crying. It is a cognitive response. They are adapting to their environment and they are becoming more deliberate and purposeful in the way they respond to people and objects. In stage five, that is about one year, six months, the child does what we call active experimentation, what we call little scientists. The child is just experimenting with whatever they see. So when you put your tin of needle down, they can open it, pour everything on the floor and spread it across the living room. The same happens with the milo, the same happens with the milk. Anything that is within their reach, they take it and then they experiment. It is what creativity on their part. They are just exploring their environment. I think recently I saw a picture of a child who opened a box of noodles, Indomie, and then he poured it, he opened all, and he poured it in the bathtub. He was just experimenting. Uh -huh. So if sometimes it's advised that you don't keep valuable things within the reach of the child, because you'll take your phone and they'll put it in the WC and flash it. They are experimenting. By age two years, they learn to do some mental combinations. So they think, yes, now they begin thinking before they do. So they know that the last time when they put their mother's phone in water, their mother beats them. So the next time they are likely not to do it. Uh -huh. They don't do try and error. They think through their actions before doing. One of the uh, milestones at the sensory motor stage is the ability of the child to have what we call object permanence. And object permanence is the realization that objects exist, even if it is taken out of sight. So first, if the child is playing with your phone and you sense that this child is likely to damage your phone, you take the phone out of sight. The child cries for a period of time and stops. But as they grow, they know that once you take the object out of sight, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist anymore. So even if they are playing with their phone and you take it away, they go around looking for it because they know that objects exist even if they are taken out of sight. If they can no longer be touched or hurt, they still exist. And that is what we call object permanence. So all that I've talked about is under the stage one. Let's move to stage two, which is the pre-operational stage. This is age about um, two to what, seven years. And what happens? Uh, the name pre-operational means that before the child can reason. So here the child is not fully thinking or have what we call formal thought. So it is, it is called the pre-operational, the pre-logical reasoning stage of the child. So by this time, the child has learned how to pick language. So they have what we call symbolic thoughts, where an object or a word can be used to stand for something else, which is in sight or imagine. So words are used to symbolize an action or an object. So the child can actually talk about a dog. They can talk about a shark. They can talk about giraffes. They can talk about dinosaurs, even without seeing the actual object because they have started acquiring language. So they use a word to stand for something or they can talk about something even if the thing is not present for them to see. Now, symbolic thoughts helps explain another phenomenon that we call animism, which is the belief that, um, non-human objects so example natural objects like trees clouds animals etc they are alive and they have what human characteristics so it is this thought that is incorporated into what we call what cartoons so you see a tree talking an animal talking and so most children's books include animals or objects that can talk and listen because the children can relate to it. 
at this stage, the children believe that these natural objects or these non-human objects, they have human abilities. So they can talk, they can sing, they can dance, anything humans can do, they can also do it. And that is why young children seem to enjoy cartoons or animal stories where they see animals, trees, and all these things talking. Then they have what we call centration, which is the tendency to focus or to center on only one object, um, aspect of a situation. So for example, young children will insist that their father is only their father. Their father cannot be somebody's brother. brother. Their father cannot be somebody's son or their father cannot be somebody's uncle. It is only their father and nothing else. So they are focusing on the only the relationship that they have with their father as their father. They, they refuse or sometimes it is difficult for them to understand that their father can have other relationships with other people. So it can be possible that your father is still your father and it's still somebody's uncle. Ha, that is what we refer to as what? Uh, centration. So the daddy's example uh, illustrates what we call egocentrism, self-centeredness. It doesn't mean they are selfish, but they are thinking in, in their own regard. For example, a child and the mother are crossing the road and the child says, oh, um, she doesn't want the mother to die. And the reason why she doesn't want the mother to die when crossing the road is that there will be nobody to take her home. So if there's an accident and somebody is supposed to die, then she, the child, prefers to die. Because if the mother dies, she cannot get anyone to take her home. That is the self-centeredness. It doesn't mean they are selfish. They are just looking in their own direction and see how situations will apply to them. Okay, so the egocentrism is Piaget's stem for children's tendency to think about other people and other and their own experiences as if everything was revolves around them. Huh. They also focus on appearance. Um, they assume that visible appearance of someone is also their essence. So they focus on only what the appearance. Uh -huh. So sometimes it is difficult for them to even, for you to convince them that the paper one CD is the same as what the coin one CD. They have what we call static reasoning. Children have what we call static reasoning. It is a characteristic that allow children to think that nothing changes. The way something is, that is how it will be forever. So they don't understand why yesterday they went to the mall and you were able to buy ice cream for them. And today you say you don't have money. Once you were able to have money yesterday, it means today you should also have money. That is what we refer to as static reasoning. We also have what we call irreversibility. It is the idea that change is permanent and nothing can be restored to the way it was before change was occurred. So if something happens and the shoe is false or the teddy bear is false, they don't believe that it can be repaired. They think that what it is forever false. That is what we refer to as the irreversibility. Then we have conservation, the principle that the amount of a substance remains the same uh, even when uh, its appearance changes. And that is the one CD example I gave. Remember, we have a paper note for one CD and a coin for one CD. For children who are in the pre-operational stage, they don't understand that the substance or the amount is still the same because they think that the paper one carries more weight than the coin one. And that is what we call the principle of con conservation. The amount of a substance remains the same even when its appearance was changes. They don't have the principle of con con conservation, sorry, conservation. Now let's look at the third stage. The third stage is what we call the concrete operational stage. The concrete operational stage here, that is between age seven to 11. Children think in concrete terms. They think logically, they reason logically, but it has to be concrete. You have to show them concrete evidence for them to accept. 
So by this age, children should be able to do what? Classification. So you give them objects to sort into what? Categories. You can give them shapes, sort all the triangles out, sort all the squares out, sort all the rectangles out. They can sort by what color, by size, by height, by weight, etc. Then they have what we call seriation. They can be able to arrange things in what ascending or descending order. So if they are able to count one up to 20, you can tell them to count in ascending order or to count in descending order or arrange the alphabets from A to Z or from C to A. They are able to do that. In the final stage, that is the stage four, they have, children have what we, or adolescents have what we call formal operational thought or intelligence. So they move past thinking in concrete terms and now they can do abstract thinking. Uh -huh. So Yaje described a shift to formal operational thought, including assumptions that have no necessary relation to what reality. The thing doesn't have to be concrete there for the child to see. Even if you are describing it in abstract terms, the adolescent should be able to relate. In formal operational thought or intelligence, adolescents have what we call egocentrism. Adolescent egocentrism. So adolescents think that um, they believe in their own uniqueness and they imagine that other people are so focused on them. So whilst people are young, and they get to the adolescent age, you see them standing behind the mirror, admiring their own uniqueness, their, how they are different from other people, how other people are looking at them. And that is what we refer to the adolescent um, egocentrism. We also have what we call personal fable, which is the belief that one's own emotions and experiences are unique, more wonderful or awful than anyone else. If they are if their experiences are unique, they think that it is only them. And if their experiences are bad, they think that it is only them that are having those worst conditions. Then we have what we call the invincibility fable. Uh -huh. They believe that they cannot be harmed by anything that can uh, defeat what uh, normal mortal. So they think unprotected cells cannot harm them. They can use drugs, they can speed high. In fact, it is the invisibility fable that makes adolescents uh, go through what we call exploration and experimentation because they think they can have unprotected sex and nothing will happen to them. They can drive at high speed, nothing will happen to them. They can abuse drugs and they will not be harmed. It is caused by what? The invisibility fable. Then we also have imaginary audience. So, yeah. Other people who in the adolescence believe watch their appearance, their ideas or their behavior. So you notice that in adolescence, they are so concerned about how they look. They want to put on a new dress. They, want, they are so overly neat, you know, they want to be, be on point. It's because what they think that people are watching their appearance and their behavior. Now, adolescent egocentrism can coexist with more logical and abstract intelligence. At this stage, they have what we call hypothetical thought. So this is reasoning that includes assumptions or prepositions that does not actually reflect what reality. So you can tell them that, let's assume you are a tree. They know that they are not a tree, but what? They can assume that proposition for the sake of that argument that you are going to have although they know in reality they are not a tree. You can say, let's assume they are pregnant or let's assume that they are married. Yes, it is not a true proposition, but they can what? They can reason, they can think in that sense just because they want to have that discussion. Adolescents are able to do deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning, so you reason from a general statement or a premise, a principle, or a logical um, thought, and they can deduce things from them. It is called what top down reasoning. So they're able to do deductive reasoning. So all humans are cats. 
Kofi is a human. It means Kofi is a cat. That is deductive reasoning. They are able to do it. Then we have inductive reasoning. You reason from a specific experience or fact to reach a general conclusion. So they can use their own experience to give what a general conclusion. And that is what we call the bottom up reasoning. We have another theories called what? Vygotsky. Vygotsky talked about social learning. He says that our intelligence is as a result of what? The way we learn socially from other uh, people in our homes, in our schools, or in our societal makeup. He emphasized uh, that our early cognition, particularly the social aspect, he stressed that our culture affects our cognition. And so we don't only learn in isolation, but um, it depends on joint engagement. So he thinks that we don't move in stages, but we, our ability to reason, our ability to think is because we are relating with others. We are learning from others, our parents, significant others, our siblings, our friends. We are connecting with them and we are learning. So he talked about what? A mentor. That is somebody who can teach or guide the child to learn, to master a skill or to become knowledgeable. So children mirror their parents. They mimic what other people do. So if in the evening if they see their mother brushing their teeth, quickly they also take their toothbrush and then they begin to brush. So the person they are emulating now becomes what? The mentor. He also talked about the zone of proximal development, ZPD, where he says that children are able to learn skills, knowledge, and concepts that a person that is close to them can do. So the, the, the principle states that they have not mastered that skill, but with a little help, with a tiny help from somebody who is close to them, children can, able to, uh, can be able to master those skills. And that is why sometimes in the classroom setting, we say that we have what we call peer teaching. So sometimes the teacher can explain the thing you will not understand. Maybe it's, it's left with something, it's just a point that you are not clear with. And once your friend explains that to you, quickly you understand. That is what we refer to what, as the zone of proximal development. So it refers to all skills, knowledge, concepts that a child is close to acquiring, but the child has not mastered it. But the child will need help from somebody that is close, a friend, a, a peer, or a mentor for the child uh, to be able to master that skill. Then finally, we have what we call scaffolding. So it is a temporary support that you are giving to the child until the child is able to what, make a, or master a skill. So let's assume that you want the child to learn how to tie the shoes. You don't wait till the child finally learns tying the shoe before you reward the child. So you'll be su supporting the child. First, if the child is able to put the first two holes, you aid the child to do the third one. Then you ask the child to do the fourth and the fifth one. So gradually you are supporting the child to learn and acquire abilities that they can learn on their own or they can do on their own later in life. So I want you to sit down and think of these theories, all that we have learned. What are the educational implications? What does it imply for you as a teacher? How are you going to apply this? When we meet in our next class, we will discuss the educational implications. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that you are studying and your studies are going well. I want you to read. If there's something that I've said here you don't understand, go on Google search. Read about it. If you don't understand, I'll create a forum for you to ask questions. Thank you very much.